Good evening, everyone. My name is Celeste Delacabra. Welcome back to the channel. Now, this video has been in the works for literal months. I've been working on this, so uh, <laughs> I do hope that it was worth the wait. Um, but yeah, we have just an astronomical amount of films to talk about today. We've got two box sets totaling 13 films and then one, two, three more. So 16 films we have to cover today, which is rather ambitious uh, considering how many films we usually cover in one of these segments. It's typically only upwards of like six, maybe five, something like that. Uh, so let's see how, how quickly we can do this. Can this video be under an hour? I doubt it, but we'll find out, I suppose. Before we get started, if you are at all interested in in-depth discussions on cult and art house films, uh, go ahead and hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, comment lovely things for me to read, share it with a pal, etc. That would all help me. And if you think that the work that I do is valuable, there is also a link in the description for my Patreon page, whereby you will be granted access to at least three patron-only videos per month, handcrafted personalized postcards, and more. So if you are unfamiliar, Vinegar Syndrome is essentially a Blu-ray distribution company and film archive specializing in forgotten genre films. Sexploitation, hardcore films, slashers, splatter films, that kind of thing, martial arts films, they restore to the best of their ability and put out in pristine premium packaging for home use and distribution. Uh, I think I've described them before as like a sleazy library of Congress that also sells Blu-rays, and I think that that is accurate. I guess let me not waste any more time. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, let's do this one first, um, as it is probably my favorite film out of this slate and also probably the most popular. Uh, we have David Cronenberg's Existence. Existence. It's new. It's from Antenna Research. And it's here. We got like a fucking dad bod belly on the front. And there's your side. Um, if you go to our uh, Blu-ray audit video where I talked about this when it arrived in the mail, we were um, pontificating on what the hell this was because we hadn't seen it yet. And now we know. Uh, but this is essentially your little plug for the gaming system. Uh, that goes in the little tramp stamp spot, the lower back, you know what I'm saying? So this is a textured slip, slip box. They said it was flush textured. I'm not really sure what it feels like to me, but it is absolutely certainly like uniquely textured uh, compared to literally everything else in my collection. Unfortunately, this box is sold out now. Um, and so is the booklet and the slipcover, but you can still get the standard edition. And I'm sure if you really want it, there are copies of this floating around. So let me continue the unboxing for you. Here we have the cover, uh, which I like a lot. Um, and I'm just now realizing that I know what this is now. <laughs> we have the uh, organic kind of like bone gun on the front. <laughs> Embossed text for the title. And we have the gaming console on the back here. And then Reversible cover art, though it's not necessarily original cover art. There's your special features if you'd like to pause there. And two disc set, 4K and Blu-ray. And we also have our booklet. It's one of these perfectly bound books, as they call them. Uh, play it, live it, kill for it. Sure. <laughs> I think I can get away with showing this. Yeah, nothing crazy in there. This one has a lot of still images because uh, the essays aren't particularly long and I guess they had to fill it out to fit in this box, but I don't know. <laughs> Existence is essentially about a company that creates a virtual reality gaming system that is made out of flesh and is its own living organism that you then plug into your own body such that it becomes like that it is the controller and you become the console and it transports you into a sort of hyper-realistic VR world where it's still clear that you're in a video game because all the NPCs like react very strangely and become kind of stuck in a loop if you don't provide them with their like needed dialogue and stuff like that. It's hard to talk about this film without spoiling too much of it. Uh, so I will avoid that to the best of my ability because I really think that this is best 
gone into blind, but essentially you have uh, Jude Law's character who is just kind of like a hired bodyguard for the VR company. And at the debut of their new gaming system called Existence, a terrorist kind of takes over and attempts to kill the game designer played by Jennifer Jason Lee. So he takes her and they go into hiding essentially. And while she has a bounty on her head, she also wants to ensure that her gaming system has survived the attack and wants to test it out. And uh, Jude Law's character has actually never played the game because he's afraid of what it will do to his body. She eventually convinces him and they go through the game and all sorts of wacky <laughs> twists and turns ensue. I think that's all, that's all I want to say in regards to the plot, because like I said, it really starts to get wild and I don't want to rob you of that experience if you've never seen it before. There were like region B copies of this floating around, I think, uh, but I think that this has been either out of print or never on Blu-ray in the United States for a very long time. Vinegar Syndrome has blessed us with this new 4K presentation, and I will say that the 4K itself looks absolutely immaculate, like it looks perfect. One of the better transfers I've seen all year. Like in terms of audiovisual presentation, I would give this, and like restoration, I'd give this like a perfect 10 out of 10. It just looks incredible. And the film itself, I just, I really loved. I think that it feels extremely prescient. Like it's one of these films that it's hard to believe it came out when it did. Uh, this is from 99. It really feels like it is commenting on issues that we are struggling with today. Like, I know that AI is kind of a big thing right now and less so VR, but they still feel very similar and they still feel as though, um, it still feels as though the, the film is commenting on similar things. There's also, I believe Apple has just come out with their premium VR device and you know, Mark Zuckerberg and his fucking metaverse shit is really big or at least is attempting to be really big. And I think it and AI kind of go hand in hand in this like desire to let technology and tech kind of that's, that's saying the same thing twice. <laughs> this kind of desire to let tech take over the experience of real life or to replace human beings. VR, I think, is substantially less dangerous than AI, but I do think that there are legitimate philosophical and practical concerns to be had with it. And I think that Cronenberg really understood this and depicts this, these problems really well. Now, a quick disclaimer is that I'm not at all a gamer, nor have I really ever been. I mean, I used to play video games when I was a kid, but uh, they mainly make me frustrated. <laughs> and I don't really have a lot of fun with them. And I don't know, when I'm going to experience art, I want the, the art to take me on a journey. I don't want to be the one in the driver's seat there. Like, it just feels fundamentally different. And, uh... I don't know, they're, they're like watching a movie is not skill-based. <laughs> Reading a book is not necessarily skill-based. Listening to a piece of music, you know? Um, whereas with video games, it feels like you have to like, it, it requires a level of skill. There's a barrier to entry, especially with some of these harder games. Um, and so, you know, it just hasn't been for me in a very long time. So again, I'm not the best person to be judging how this captures the experience of playing games, even though it is something I do have some amount of experience with. Particularly the way that NPCs are portrayed feels really accurate, and he really captures the uncanniness of it in like a real world setting or like a live action setting. Uh, video game movies are notoriously not very good, uh, be because I think that this is not necessarily attempting to mm, adapt one in particular. It's kind of taking on video games as a concept and virtual reality as a concept. I think Cronenberg is kind of the perfect person to do it. This sort of disconnect between the mind and the body and attempting to utilize the body to create a fictional kind of virtual universe that you can inhabit. Yeah, a lot of people kind of accuse this of being like a movie about video games for people who don't play video games, and I suppose I'm not the one to counteract that criticism, but I do know that Cronenberg was playing a lot of games at the time that this was created, at the time that he came up with the idea for the script. He was also inspired a lot by the fatwa on Salman Rushdie, this kind of idea of terrorist attacks on creative figures. He's really interested in this idea that two people can have such opposing views of morality and of the world that they would be willing to kill each other over it, you know? And that coupled with 
his exploration of, I mean, it's not exactly an original idea and it's kind of like, when you say it out loud, it kind of feels like a pothead kind of pontificating on philosophy, this kind of like idea where you don't know what is real and what is fake. You don't know what is actually happening and what is in a game. But I think I really do feel that Cronenberg captures that anxiety and that kind of existential terror really well as the film progresses. I mean, I could talk more about it. Like the performances are excellent. I think that they are good and bad in the ways that they need to be. I love the production design here. I love the special effects. It's just a film that I could see myself revisiting time and time again. And I kind of did watching all these commentaries and I never got tired of it. And I always found something new to appreciate. Uh, there's tons of memorable scenes in here. It's just generally a really, really great film. And I think I landed on an eight out of 10 for this one. I highly recommend it. So now that I've kind of rambled enough about the film itself, let's uh, let's get into the special features. Step into my office. So in terms of the special features, there are a lot of them. Uh, this is one of their more packed editions, I think, which is great because you know, this is a pretty big get for them, like a uh, pretty major work from Cronenberg's filmography. They went all out for it, uh, and I think that it deserved it. So let's see. We had four commentary tracks, which was absurd. Like I looked at that and I was like, what am I doing? Am I going to be able to do this? Have I? Do I need to give up now? I didn't. I listened to them all. But <laughs> four commentary tracks. Uh, one of them is brand new and, and three of them are archival. It's nice that we are covering our bases with like the stuff that's already been out there on previous releases and also adding new stuff. I think that that is really cool. So the new commentary track is with film historian Dr. Jennifer Mormon. This is the best one, I think. If you only listen to one, make it this one. It is so good. It is just an excellent academic and analytical commentary track. It really does a great job of exploring the roles that philosophy and gender play in the film. You know, existentialism, given the title, and also the gender and sexual dynamics in the film are really quite interesting, and she has a lot of insightful things to say about it. Uh, particularly the ways that sex is subverted and throughout the film the male body is the one that is most often subjected to penetration and discomfort. It's really fascinating and of course there are really interesting ideas as they relate to like women in video games and Gamergate specifically. I think that this was rather prescient in how women in this industry are treated and how angry dudes can get at their mere presence in positions of power. The next is an archival commentary track with the uh, director, one Mr. David Cronenberg. You may have heard of him. It's not like a ton of insight in it, but I just like listening to David Cronenberg talk about really anything, but his own movies is always fun, right? So the whole thing is really listenable and enjoyable. Uh, if you if you want to listen to a director's commentary here, I don't think you'll be disappointed with this track. The next is an archival commentary track with the cinematographer, uh, Peter... So, Sajiski. I don't recommend this one. I think you can go ahead and skip it. There's not a ton of insight or even like a lot of discussion. I definitely skipped around on this one. And then finally, there is an archival commentary track with the visual effects supervisor, Jim Isaac. Uh, this one is excellent. I really think it should have been a select scene commentary because he really only has things to say about the scenes with lots of visual effects in them. And so there's a lot of like nothing throughout this commentary as he's waiting for the next big like VFX showcase. And so, yeah, I think we could have made this a select scene one, but it's really good and it's worth watching, I think. So in terms of the actual features, we have an interview with the art director, Tamara Deverell on building the worlds of existence. She discusses uh, working as one of the few women in production design in Canada. Uh, she first worked with Cronenberg on Crash, another excellent film, by the way, and talks about how she always felt his films had a sense of humor. And when they discussed that, he said that he was glad that he that she saw that in his films because most people miss it. She also discusses how prescient she feels the themes are and how concerning she finds the way VR is going. I think she even made a comment about like how her kids have VR game systems and that she sees them going through the same things these characters go through where they just get sucked in and they sometimes have trouble distinguishing reality from virtual reality and she finds it concerning and feels that this film was ahead of its time. She also makes an interesting point about how as a production designer, you kind of have to accept and come to terms with the fact that the camera is not going to capture all the hard work you've done and some of it will just be lost forever. Like you can spend a lot of time on this one particular aspect of the production design, but if it doesn't make sense for the shot, it's either going to just be 
a flash in the pan in the background or it's not even going to be in the shot at all. And so you've done all that work for something that makes sense as a whole. It contributes to the overall experience of the production design and the overall aesthetic and the overall look. But specific things you spent a lot of time on or put a lot of creative energy into just might not ever show up in the way that you would like them to. I thought that that was really interesting. And she talks about how that's just a necessary part of doing this work is accepting that that will happen. <laughs> Next is an uh, interview with the makeup effects artist, uh, Stefan du Dupuis. I'm always fucking these people's names up, I'm sorry. Um, it's a really great interview. Uh, he discusses how many of the effects were achieved and the kind of philosophy behind them. Uh, he says that the hardest take or the hardest shot in the whole film was when the waiter's face explodes, um, but he did it in one take because it would have been very difficult to do it more than once. Next is an interview with the producer, uh, Robert Lantos. He just kind of just calls Cronenberg a genius. <laughs> Next is an interview with the opening title designer, Robert Pilachowski. Uh, it's a really cool and unique look into the craft of creating opening title designs. He describes the opening title sequence as a short film within the film itself, like that's how he approaches them. Uh, and that their purpose is to set the tone and the aesthetic of the film rather than just showing you the title and the cast. And he kind of bemoans how title sequences, I think Cronenberg says this at some point too, how past the age of television, films kind of forgot that this is its own section in the film that can be like artistic. And they kind of just copy the method of putting titles on the screen as the film is progressing, because that's a time-saving measure. It's not really an artistic choice most of the time, but a lot of people are sort of relying on that. I thought that that was really interesting and I love a good title sequence, so. I recommend that interview. Uh, and next, this is maybe my favorite feature on here, other than that commentary. Uh, it's a full-length documentary. It's called Frame by Frame, The Invisible Art of Production Designer, Carol Spire? Spear? S-P-I-E-R, I'm so sorry. Uh, it's really great. It's about her, but it also kind of doubles as a as a making of documentary on existence because it kind of follows her as she's crafting the production design for this film in particular. Uh, I thought there was a super interesting section on it about how the special effects department and the production design department work together kind of in tandem because the idea is that like you need your special effects to work within the context of the production design. You have to know exactly what's going into the production design before you can actually start working on a special effect and you need to know how it interacts with this environment, what kind of space and what kind of tools you have at your disposal. Yeah, it was just really interesting seeing how the visual effects supervisor like had to follow her everywhere and had to make sure that he understood entirely what was going on on the production design side of things so that he could create special effects that actually gelled with the aesthetic and the uh, mechanics of the film. It was also really fascinating to see uh, Cronenberg work in his capacity as a director and how many people just put so much work into this film. It, it's really just kind of incredible and it makes you wonder how a film this weird even gets made with how expensive it is and how many people have to be on board for it. Uh, it's really just kind of a small miracle that films like this even exist. I also really liked seeing how Carol is basically a director in her own right, like a, like a, like a, like a subsidiary director to Cronenberg. She says that like her policy is that she never ever brings an issue to David unless there is a like significant budgetary restriction and she's exhausted all other options. Um, and he says that what he looks for in a production designer is someone that he can just fully trust to do it and only come to him when there's that budgetary restriction. So you just kind of watch her like uh, directing her own department and she's basically like a director on the film and then she goes to the head director whenever there's an actual issue, but basically they just, she just does her job and she's almost like working in her own little world and like gets that piece of the equation done after she's discussed it with a director and then he can just focus on directing the actors and workshopping the script and things like that. There is an archival promotional featurette, an archival special effects featurette, um, and some electronic press kit interviews. Uh, there's a lot of like repetition throughout the different special features because they pull a lot of clips from these uh, EPK interviews. Um, but I recommend watching the one from Jude Law, Willem Dafoe, and the special effects guy. Although I will say that archival special effects featurette is a truncated version of that larger interview. So just watch that one. But next we have this booklet. Um, 
So first, we have an essay from Justin LaLiberty. It's called Existence Y2K and the Virtual Reality Films of the 90s. Um, he kind of just places this in the context of VR as a concept in sci-fi in mid to large budget films in the late 90s and early 2000s. And he specifically hones in on three films that came out in 1999 specifically, Existence, The Matrix, and The 13th Floor. Uh, so he kind of discusses how they all work within the same themes in the same year. And it's a really interesting read. I don't know that I've ever read one of Justin's essays before, so I really enjoyed it. And then the next essay is called Existence in the Art of Interactivity by John Derringer. Uh, this one I, I definitely preferred and I really, really enjoyed. This is where I pulled a lot of the information about uh, Cronenberg's relationship to video games because it discusses it a lot in this essay. It kind of pulls a lot of information from the interviews that he was giving a lot at the time and kind of analyzes where he was at during the making of this film. He talks about how Cronenberg was having a very public kind of debate with himself about whether or not video games constituted art. Now, I personally feel that they do, but he feels that even though he loves them and he thinks that there are there is a ton of artistic merit to them, he feels that the fundamental difference that I was discussing earlier, how uh, a video game asks the, part, the, the audience to actually participate and kind of direct the experience versus any other medium where the viewer or the audience member is simply like along for the ride. Um, he thinks that that distinction matters a lot and it might actually disqualify video games as being art. Um, I thought that was pretty interesting and I really liked that. It also goes into Gamergate as well. So uh, I recommend reading that if you are fortunate enough to have a copy because it is out of print. Okay, so from my favorite film of the bunch to probably my least favorite, let's go ahead and discuss Fatal Games. Okay, let's do a quick unboxing first. You have this artwork, which I actually really like. I think it is sick. You have this kind of mm, imagery that will perhaps make more sense once you've seen the film. You do have original poster art, original reversible art, which I really like. Then just the one disc and you have your slip art as the reversible. I also have the alternate slip cover because it was the April Fool's Day uh, surprise slip. So I think it's fun. It has the kind of uh, retro video game type of look to it. And there's that. And um, you like play a game or some shit? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's a... Uh, it's a little scratch off game that you can play that I have not touched because I will be selling this. I cannot meaningfully discuss this film without spoiling it. So there's going to be a time code here where you can just skip to our discussion on the Prophecy Trilogy. If you don't want this spoiled for you, if you've already seen it or you just don't really care about having shitty 80s slasher spoiled for you, go. Let's let's go ahead and proceed. Right. So Fatal Games is about these high schoolers that are training to be Olympic athletes, they have, uh, I'm not going to pretend to know how sports work, so bear with me, but they have essentially advanced far enough such that they are going to be training for the Olympics, I guess, something like that. So we've got people doing like gymnastics, they've got uh, javelin throwing, they've got all sorts of stuff going on, right? And unfortunately for them, a mysterious killer is killing these students these athletes with a javelin, kind of one by one, and they have to kind of get to the bottom of it and everything, right? <laughs> it's got a fun score to it, I will say that. Uh, the, the, the conceit is at least interesting and unique. It's kind of boring, honestly, uh, but it is more or less fairly entertaining uh, throughout most of its runtime. And like I said, the kill scenes are especially uh, unique and kind of entertaining. There's tons and tons of like weird, maybe not weird, I don't know. There's a lot of gratuitous nudity to this as well. It is weird because the characters are high schoolers, but you know, obviously the actors are all adults and you come to expect this kind of thing. It does feel particularly egregious <laughs> in this regard. There's a massage scene that is particularly graphic. There is a chase scene where the killer is chasing one of these students and she's just fully naked running through the school for a while. There's a lot of sh scenes kind of taking place in women's locker rooms with lots of women taking showers. Um, to be fair, they do the same thing 
in the men's locker room, uh, though it is not nearly as often, and you really just see a couple bare butts. You don't get to see any any hog in this one, which is perhaps unfortunate. Um, yeah, there's just a ton of gratuitous nudity in this one, and um, I've delayed it long enough, so let's go ahead and talk about the ending or the twist to this film. If you've been watching my videos long enough and you know the types of tropes that I find to be irritating, unoriginal, and problematic, you could probably guess this one a mile away. Now, we've discussed on this channel fucking more than once at this point the trope of the killer being a woman, but it turns out that she's actually a man, right? Like, she's just dressing up as a woman, and she may or may not actually be transgender, but, like, that's the idea. You're like, oh, that's so weird. That's so scary. It's, it's a man dressed as a woman killing people. This is, of course, particularly pernicious and problematic in today's political climate and discourse, uh, given that one of the main driving factors of transphobia is this idea that men are pretending to be women to invade women's spaces, but also to um, inflict violence upon them, whether that be sexual or otherwise. Uh, this one is, because I've, I've seen quite a few films with this trope, right? You've, I mean, the, the, there's like the Silence of the Lambs and Sleepaway Camp and Dress to Kill. I'm sorry if I just spoiled all these films for you, but like, those, I think, are defensible and reclaimable to certain extents, depending on your own relationship to this issue and your own um, willingness to grant a little bit of charity, which is a little bit of charitability to the writers on this, right? This, however, I don't see as being defensible even a little bit, and it feels actively harmful in a way that the rest of them haven't been. Like this, I, I said this in my letterbox review, and if this is kind of an extreme analogy, you know, I'm sorry. I'm really not though. Like it, it really, it really does feel like the trans equivalent of like Birth of a Nation, where in that film, the entire purpose of it is to show black people at their most like violent stereotypes and using white actors to portray that, right? The whole point is to like be propaganda about how black people are dangerous and they need to be curtailed, right? That's the whole point of Birth of a Nation, despite what people may tell you, that film is racist as fuck. This feels like it's doing a similar thing for the trans community. I don't, now I'm gonna say, Birth of a Nation is absolutely on purpose. That is explicitly the point of the film. I don't think that this was written to be. If this came out today, like no shot. It This is like Daily Wire shit. But like <laughs> in, the, in the context that it came out in, I don't think that this was necessarily like coming from a place of hatred for transgender people, but the way it plays out is just as harmful, I think. I realize now I'm not actually described the twist, um, so I might not be making a lot of sense, but essentially the uh, the school nurse, I guess, um, who is a woman and who, you know, helps these girls out throughout and helps the students out is actually a trans woman, and they say this pretty explicitly. She has had um, bottom surgery and everything. And essentially she is killing these students because she was disqualified from the Olympics because it literally has a, has a newspaper where it says that like there was a botched sex change surgery or whatever. And so she was disqualified for having levels of male hormones that were not acceptable to be competing against women, right? And because of this perceived slight against her or whatever, his motivation truly doesn't make any sense. But she's killing all the students so that, I guess, so that they can't compete either. This kind of like spite-driven <laughs> homicidal behavior, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. But that in and of itself, whatever. But there's a few details here that I need to address. First of all, when we first discover this, they they pitch down her voice such that, I mean, you're, she's supposed to sound like a man, like that's her real voice, which is not how this works. But also like, she sounds like a monster, like this kind of like weird garbled, hyper deep like voice that she has when she's like screaming and like chasing the, the final girl around with the javelin. It is quite literally like designed to make a trans woman look and feel monstrous. There's also a scene early on where she is giving the same character a massage. 
and the the student is fully naked, right? And she's giving her this massage, but it gets to the point where she like starts feeling up her genitals and she starts being like really inappropriate and creepy. Um, and like, as I was watching that scene, I was like, that's weird. I don't much care for that. Like that, it already felt kind of homophobic um, because I, fuck, I hope I get this right. But I believe this is the same character that has a girlfriend and is a lesbian in the film. I hope I got that right. If not, I'm sorry. The point still stands that it's weird, right? And it's like super predatory, disgusting behavior. But it's especially pernicious when we learn that she's a trans woman and the scene is portrayed as like a man feeling up underage women and like sexually assaulting them because they have like tricked them into being in that same space and in that position of intimacy and trust, right? Anyway. The film was fine up until then. I was not like in love with it or anything. I was just like, okay, it's fine. Like it's kind of boring. I'm kind of struggling to pay attention, but like, I like the aesthetic of it. I like the vibe. I like the kills. I like, there's a lot of things to like about it. And I think I could like it more upon a rewatch. But when that ending happened, I was just kind of horrified. And it was not, it was a little bit upsetting, I have to be honest. And like some of that is not necessarily their fault. Like they have predicted a lot of really toxic genocidal discourse that is going on today. And I don't think they can be held responsible for that or necessarily know that that's where the conversation was headed. But there's something that feels especially dangerous about it, given the the uh, the state of the discourse in this country right now. Anyway, I landed on a four out of 10 for this one. I haven't decided if I'm going to sell it yet. I'm definitely selling the slipcover, but I don't know. I could see myself rewatching it, knowing what's going to happen and maybe appreciating it more. And the features on it are good, but... I, I might just get rid of it for now. And if I decide I want to get it again, I can always get it again, right? Anyway, onto the special features. Um, there's a commentary track with uh, Bill Ackerman and Amanda Reyes. Uh, they are always excellent. Um, they come super, super prepared and are just, like there's not a, a, a lull or a dull moment in their commentary. They are jam packing information front to back, right? They had maybe the most interesting insight out of any of the features in that they kind of explained, like they acknowledged that the that the twist is like super problematic and like fucked up and looks really bad in the context of today. But their take on the twist is that it has more to do with Cold War era tensions of the time rather than an actual comment on trans athletes or trans people. Like right now it's impossible to watch that and not feel like they are making a comment about how trans women or men invading women's spaces to cheat and to harm biological women right like that's that's the takeaway when you watch it today given the discourse right now but the discourse at the time was um about cold war tensions as it relates to the olympics right so essentially what happened was as more female athletes from eastern europe european countries started to compete um western audiences started cooking up conspiracy theories about them as they were more masculine looking and less like hyper feminine than Western audiences were accustomed to seeing in women or in athletes. And so they started cooking up these conspiracy theories about how um, these like communist countries were actually sending men dressed as women to like cheat and get a leg up in this kind of proxy war kind of event of like competition between countries, right? I think that makes a lot of sense and it's still not great, right? It's, it's interesting, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't see that there's a way to get around it. it. Even if it's not intentionally transphobic, it absolutely is, right? But I definitely recommend listening to that, that commentary if you enjoyed the film or if you just want to get more information on it or maybe revisit it with some more context, right? Next is an interview with the actress Tracy Helberg. Uh, she played the lead and she said that she agreed to do nudity, but her agent like freaked out and said, absolutely not. <laughs> there was a scene where she was supposed to be doing her like, gymnast routine completely nude which would have been very uncomfortable and not made a lot of sense and would have been fairly gratuitous but she said she was willing to do it and there is conflicting reports as to whether or not that scene was actually shot but in terms of her massage scene Linnea Quigley was a last minute kind of 
body double for that sequence. And she is a real gymnast, by the way. Uh, they hired her because she could do all the moves for real and also she was a decent actress. So she says that the transgender aspect was ahead of its time. She's not wrong, but she says that a little bit too neutrally for me. Uh, and then she said nice things about Vinegar Syndrome at the end of the interview, which was nice. Uh, next is an interview with the actor Sean Masterson. Uh, he says that he only got the part because he had blonde hair and he wanted him to match the love interest. Like it was between him and this other guy who had brown hair. And um, that's what did it, right? He says that the director didn't like horror films and would try to get the like bloody bits of this of the script shot in as little takes as possible so they could move on. And he says that the actress for the transgender nurse was absolutely livid that they pitched her voice down after the reveal and at the premiere, she was like visibly upset and like left the theater because she felt that it like ruined her performance in that moment. And he said that he tried to comfort her and say that she was still like very obviously the best actor in the whole film. <laughs> uh, next is an interview with the actor Michael O'Leary. Uh, he says that during his death scene, there was some contention as the director wanted him to put the javelin end in his mouth and then fall down the stairs. And he was like, bro, I'm going to choke on that. Like you do it. What the fuck? And after some, perhaps, argument and uh, additional contention, he finally did it. And then it didn't even end up in the film. There's an interview with the actress Melissa Prophet, And then there's an interview with the actress Spice Williams Crosby. Uh, she said that she went to practice her lesbian kiss scene. Um, but the other actress said that they couldn't do it. <laughs> so, I don't know. They, they ended up settling on what's in the film where they are touching each other a lot and it's rather intimate, but they're not kissing, right? And then finally, there's an interview with the editor and associate producer, Jonathan Braun. Um, he received the associate producer credit for a pay cut of $1,000 a week. <laughs> I guess that is a financial contribution in some respect, right? And he said he wanted to be a cinematographer, but was incidentally better at editing, so he got work doing that but he did end up directing the underwater scene, which is, in my opinion, the best scene in the film. It is really beautiful and really unique and creative and just really fucking cool looking. <laughs> he says that the director would make a lot of decisions using pickup sticks. And he says that he wanted the music played backwards and he had to be like, bro, no, that's not going to work. That's fucking stupid. <laughs> so that's Fatal Games. Um, I don't know. I don't recommend it, but if you're a fan of the film or if you have a morbid curiosity for what I've just described, it's a good release. I'll say that. And the features are good, but uh, yeah, I think I think that's enough on Fatal Games. <laughs> nice hair. All right. So next we have from the man Christopher Walken. I will re resist doing an impression throughout this. Um, the Prophecy Trilogy. I kill firstborns while their mamas watch. The prophecy. Uh, this fancy packaging here is still in stock, I believe, so you can still get it. Uh, but it's one of these uh, sandwich cuts has a uh, Avery coined, and I like to call it now. Um, so it goes like this. I do feel that this was less justified than it was on the. Uh, Blade in the Dark packaging, although it does still interact, right? You get like this kind of bird thing going on over here and then in the back, look at that. He's got a wing, neat. All right, so put that slice over there and uh, there's no booklet or anything in here. It's just fancy packaging. Um, but here's your slip cover, the papyrus ass font going on uh, and the Symbol utilized throughout the film. There's your back there. Um, I don't know what happened here. Uh, uh, maybe the slip covers are getting tighter or something because I keep this keeps happening to me. This one was particularly egregious, but uh, plastic got caught on there pretty good. So there's that. Um, there's your features and shit if you want to pause and look at that. And then it's a one, two, three, four disc set. You got two 4Ks and two Blu-rays. Um, and yeah, you get the first Prophecy on one 4K and then you get two and three on the second 4K and then it's repeated for the Blu-rays. 
So let's talk about the prophecy films. Uh, um, mm. very good. So these are <laughs> these are fairly mainstream films. You may have actually seen at least the first one already, and they have been out and about for some time on home video. Uh, they are Miramax films, I believe, because they were produced by the uh, Weinstein's. So I think that they were kind of maybe out of print or trapped on that for a little bit. And it seems that Vinegar Syndrome has gone and liberated them. Uh, they are Paramount films, though. So I don't fucking know what I'm talking about. But I know that they did get produced by the wine scenes. So yeah, the first one, this is obviously the best of the three in terms of production value and amount of thought that went into it and everything. I don't know. It's entertaining for what it is. It's like a really trashy kind of mall goth movie and also literally just like Christian fan fiction. Um, I don't know. It's it's so convoluted in its theology that <laughs> I think this might actually work better for somebody who doesn't know anything about theology or Christianity or like the history of the Bible and things like that. Um, as I grew up religious and now as a edgy atheist have actually taken a lot of interest in the historical aspects of the Bible, like the history of the Bible. And, um, I don't know. I know a lot about this stuff. So when it gets things wrong or it just kind of makes up its own rules, it is confusing to me. <laughs> and so it was kind of hard for me to follow it because it would be drawing upon real theology, real theology, you know, like actual like Christian lore or like catechism shit, but then also like making shit up at the same time. And so it was, it was very confusing to me in that regard. I do feel that this is the film's weakest point is that it is trying to be like a very serious, like take on uh, theology and Christianity. And it is trying to establish a very convoluted lore <laughs> that is actually just very silly. Uh, and so, I don't know. It, it, it thinks it's much smarter than it is, and it tries to be much more than it, it really can be. And so in that regard, it is maybe a little bit head scratching or eye roll inducing, but I think if you get past that, or if you just don't know enough about this stuff to get lost in the weeds as to like what it is they're trying to say from a theological perspective, I think you can probably get more out of this. And I know that Avery did when we watched it together. Um, her and my other partner, Sam, were like both fairly entertained by it and were not nearly as confused as I was because they were just rolling with the punches, you know? Although I will say, I, I like the idea of taking all this stuff and making fan fiction out of it. I think that that is a cool idea in concept because I know that a lot of people find this sort of thing blasphemous, though I feel like the target demographic for this is like, people who go to church but don't really know that much about it like they go because they know they're supposed to and they want to see a cool movie that like honors god or something i don't know um but people who are really into this i believe found this to be pretty blasphemous and a lot of people uh, were not cool with the liberties taken to the inherent word of god and you know this that and the other <laughs> at a point i was arriving to oh so they watched it and just found it to be silly and entertaining whereas i was getting caught up on the minutia of all the things that they were just that they were discussing right um anyway christopher walken's performance in this is really something else and needs to be seen to be believed look i need your help i'm short staffed at the moment there's so there's so many little things in this that just i i, I struggle to understand how or why the hair on screen like the perching thing is so bizarre uh if you're not used to it so in the film like the angels how they just hang out is they perch on like ledges and like chair backrests and all sorts of things um i don't know it's just bizarre and uh vegan mortensen is in here and has one of the most insane lines of dialogue i have ever seen in a film in my life <laughs> He says something like, like, if I, if I wanted to, I could, like, put you in a vat of your mother's shit or something. It is just the most insane thing. Like, if you look up, hold on, let me look it up. I can lay you out and fill your mouth with your mother's feces. 
before we can talk. I can lay you out and fill your mouth with your mother's feces, or we can talk. This is the most insane shit I've ever heard. Jesus Christ. I am always open, even on Christmas. Anyway, there's stuff like that throughout. There's like a weird thing where the angels are like being fairly pedophilic to some of the children in some of these scenes. Um, and it's very uncomfortable. And I think it's intentional, though it's not entirely clear to me. Um, I don't know. It's a wild fucking movie. I, not all of it works for me, but it is fairly entertaining and I could see myself revisiting it. The um, They're all in 4K and the 4Ks all look quite good, by the way. So... Moving on to the second one, I actually prefer this one. It's my favorite of the trilogy because I think it recognizes what it is and it's not trying to be more than it's not. And so it really just kind of ramps up the goofiness and tones down the like convoluted lore. Um, Christopher Walken is again having a blast being a weird little freak. Uh, Brittany Murphy is in this and actually gives a fantastic performance. Glenn Danzig is in this for a second, which is fun. And uh, uh, Jennifer Beale is in it. So like it actually has a pretty good cast and they're just doing a really silly movie. And it's just, I think more entertaining than the first one. Less head scratch inducing than the first one. And I generally have a good time with it. So this is my preferred prophecy film. Um, yeah. And then the third one is bad. It's just really bad. It's clear that they didn't know where to go with it. They had like Christopher Walken like for a little bit longer. He's not really in it much. He just kind of meanders and looks weird and with his with his weird ass wig and it's just it doesn't really work at all, honestly. And it's you're kind of on board for like the first half. And at least for me, it just lost me in the second half. And I could not have cared less about what was happening. And it was just generally a complete mess. And yeah, there's not a ton of, there's some fun moments in it. There's a quote about a donut that one of the angels gives that is pretty fun and entertaining. And um, I don't know. I didn't care for it. It's just not, it's not great. <laughs> That's really all I have to say about it. Um, the first two I gave a 6 out of 10 each, and then the last one I gave a 3 out of 10. I don't know. It's worth watching, I guess, but it's just so boring. There's just nothing that happens in it. Yeah, that's the Prophecy Trilogy. I, I genuinely don't really have a ton to say about it, because I just think that they're fine, and they're kind of goofy, but, uh, I don't know. It's, the experience of watching these was a little bit weird, because they are larger budget films. These aren't, like, homemade fucking you know, slashers or sexploitation made on a shoestring budget, but they're also not existence, you know? Like, they're at that budget, but they're certainly not at that level of quality. And so you were kind of watching the worst of both worlds, where, like, you're watching a, a slick, high production value thing that is also just not that good. Um, so it's removing a lot of that charm and a lot of that, like, auteur-driven kind of weirdness. Uh, I don't know. They're fine, you know? Let, let, let's move on to the features. Okay, Prophecy Trilogy. So there's three making of documentaries and then a director's commentary or a commentary for each film and that's it. So not the most stacked, but you get like, it gets the job done. You know, you have really everything that I think you could reasonably want on here. And it's, it's nice, I think, to watch all these interviews consolidated in an edited documentary as opposed to just like a bunch of interviews to watch back to back to back. It's nice. So the documentary on the first film is called The War in Heaven, The Making of the Prophecy. It's probably my favorite feature just overall on this whole thing. Um, probably like the one you wanna watch if you're gonna watch something. There's some just really insane anecdotes in this. Apparently the producer had a lot of trouble securing funding due to the blasphemous nature of the story. One studio actually said yes and was gonna give them a good amount of money, but they said that they had to change the angels to demons. And he was just like, no, that's the whole point. The whole point of the film is that the angels are like the bad guys and it subverts that expectation. And like, it's not, it's just any other film if you change that, right? Apparently, Christopher Walken... Prepare yourself, because I'm about to tell you the most insane shit I've ever heard. <laughs> he apparently, one, gets a script, and the first thing he does is he removes all of the punctuation, and that's why he talks like that. That's insane to me, but also, I guess, it at least creates a trademark uniqueness, right? And it explains a lot, really. But apparently, my man just keeps raw garlic in his pocket. And whenever he's not actively acting, he is pacing around and munching on raw garlic at all times. 
That's the most insane shit I've ever heard. But apparently, that's what he does. Now, the making of for the second one is called Return to Eden. Uh, it discusses a lot about Brittany Murphy and how great she was. Apparently, Christopher Walken really went to bat for her, like really saw that she was extraordinarily talented and would use his clout on set uh, to insist that she got more coverage and more screen time. Apparently, this one had a much lower budget, but Christopher Walken's salary was increased. Um, apparently, the uh, actor for Daniel, who is an Asian American actor, was cast partially because the director really values diversity and representation because uh, I believe his daughter is non-white. Apparently Danzig was super nice and fun to work with. Like everybody said that, which is shocking to me because he has a reputation for being a real piece of work, but I guess he was really nice on the Prophecy set. And then the third one is called um, The War on Earth, The Making of the Prophecy 3. <laughs> the guy who plays the kid in the film is still like this very like queer looking punk, which I really like. Um, he's got like a big industrial piercing and really big earrings. Like he just, he looks like a punk kid still. Um, apparently, uh, Christopher Walken was the one who insisted on this ridiculous wig that he wears in the film. And, you know, they had to shoot the scene of, like, the giant pile of naked bodies. And apparently, the, uh, the makeup artist just walked up to the director and was like, I'd like to be in that pile. And he was like, okay. And then she took all her clothes off and went in the pile and got to be in the film a little bit. So, uh, that's fun, right? <laughs> And then there's a commentary track for the first one with the director and uh, the producer, uh, Joel Swasson, uh, is the kind of connective tissue and the through line between all of this. He's in all of the documentaries and he is on all of the commentaries. Uh, he's really seemed to be the primary vision for this and the primary like glue holding this franchise together. The commentary tracks are all fine. I kind of skipped around on especially the second and third one. Uh, the second one is with the director, Greg Spence and the producer, and then the third one is with the director, Patrick Lucier, and the uh, producer. The third one especially was rough because I will not lie, the director's voice is grating. The way he talks is really tough to listen to. So I didn't get very far on that one. I don't know, they're fine. They, they're serviceable commentary, so that's that on the prophecy. You know what, there is one more anecdote I wanted to share about the producer where he said that <laughs> during the making of the first one, the the producer was on set and Christopher Walken was like, hey man, can I talk to you real quick? And he pulled him aside and then he just fucking laid into him and was yelling at him and was like, this is the most like amateur hour piece of shit production I've ever been a part of. You need to get your shit together or I'm walking. And then that was it. He's like, okay, glad I had this talk with you. And then that was that. Uh, I guess the producer felt that he then made some adjustments and they didn't have to have a talk again. But he says that he was really grateful for that interaction and he felt that that was a really professional and kind way to go about it because a lot of stars will berate you like on set in front of everybody and make a big show of it but he wanted it to be like a more private interaction that actually gave some feedback right i thought that was interesting okay that's the prophecy moving along and the last of our sort of single feature discs before we get on to the absolute behemoth at the end of this video is the Black Room. I just want to know one thing up front. Are there any restrictions? Restrictions? No. This isn't the YMCA. Mary! Got some fun slipcover art there. Some fun the back artwork there. And then we have this rather contentious artwork. If you saw our uh, audit video about it, uh, we have your original poster art here, which I really like. I think it's kind of abstract and creepy and weird, and you got the big honking titties on it, which is always fun. Uh, and then there's your special features there. It is reversible, so you get the slip art on the back on the other side, and then there's your disc. Okay, so The Black Room. This is essentially a film about a guy, a married man with kids who discovers an ad for a kind of swingers room that he can rent out where he can take his mistresses and sort of have a fancy little pad to cheat on his wife, right? Unbeknownst to him, the owners of this uh, room in the Hollywood Hills are uh, less than scrupulous in their ethics and secretly peep on the people who rent out this room and also capture the women who are brought over to harvest their blood. The uh, 
the owners of the of the establishment are a sort of incestuous pair of siblings, a, a brother and sister who the brother is is dying of some kind of blood related ailment ailment and so they kind of harvest the victim's blood to provide transfusions for him. Um, some people consider this to be a vampire film. I didn't really think of it that way until I read about it afterwards and people were saying that, which does make sense, but I kind of read it as more of like, I don't know, it's just kind of like a weird, weird freak movie of sorts, I think. Like, I don't know, I've never seen a vampire film where they, they harvest blood through transfusion and it's pretty gross and like tough to watch, but they're not like biting necks and shit, you know? I don't know, I really liked this. It's a really weird, unique, kind of sleazy, kinky film. Um, you know, without getting too much into spoilers or anything, there's some really interesting sort of gender and sexual dynamics between the man and his wife. And there's some interesting explorations of like polyamory in maybe a less than ideal or less than ethical context, but it's still there and it's still interesting to me. Um, there's also like, uh, I don't know, it's just a really sleazy, bloody, unique film and i really like the vibe of it too like i think it has a beautiful aesthetic to it and i think that it has some really interesting camera work like the camera is moving a lot and doing some unique things and i think the performances are all quite good i think the restoration looks really good i don't know i was just kind of into this you know that kind of thing sounds like your jam like a uh, sort of non-normative sexual practices and uh looks into that sort of thing so if you want another entry into the icu this qualifies and if you want something really bloody and weird i don't know i think you could do worse than this i really enjoyed it a lot and uh i landed on a 7 out of 10 for this one uh so moving on to the features there are quite a few and i thought that they were really good and interesting so First, there's an interview with the director, uh, Ellie Kenner. He says that he had a different vision for the film and he wanted to rewrite the script, but was advised not to, which I thought was interesting. Uh, there's an interview with the actor, Jimmy Stathis, an interview with the actress, Claire Korf, which is a really good interview. Um, I say it's good, it's interesting. I don't know, there's some weird stuff in here, but let's, let's discuss it. Uh, she says that she quit acting to be a wife and she really related to her character, who was the wife in the film, because in real life, she wants to please her husband and enjoys, like, cooking all of his meals. It was this weird thing where she was like, I really love that my purpose in life is to, like, be a wife and serve my husband. And I quit my career as an actor to do this. And it was a great decision. You know what? I, I think there is a there is something there is room in feminism to be uh, 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 just a housewife and if that is what makes you happy I guess go for it I can't help but feel like some of it is rooted in like internalized patriarchal ideas and misogyny but like I don't know it seems sincere to me I guess it's up for interpretation and I'm not here to tell anybody how to live their life right uh, she also says that she originally agreed to do nudity for the film. Like, it just was like, sure, whatever, I'll do that. Like, she saw it in the script. But then when it actually came time to uh, uh, yell action on it, she basically, like, begged the director <laughs> to, like, not do it and got her way on that. So good for her, I guess. Uh, <laughs> there's an interview with the special effects artist Mark Showstrom. Um... This one made me feel a little bit bad. He kind of discussed how, like, <laughs> this was his first professional project as a special effects artist, and, like, tons of people on set were being, like, really mean to him and telling him that, like, he was doing a, a shit job, and then other people on set would be like, don't listen to them, you're doing great. Like, they're just mean. It's fine. Um, oh, my bad. He said it was his second professional project ever. And uh, he said that the effect of the blood extraction was the hardest thing to do and was especially challenging. Um, I don't know. I felt kind of bad for him. Like, he's doing his best, okay? The last interview with people actually on set or actually involved in the making of the film uh, is an interview with the production assistant, Lisa Cronin. This is the best one on the disc, I think. I have quite a lot to say about it. Um, 
She's the daughter of the producer who uh, actually appears nude in the first sex scene, not her, her father. So that was an interesting little anecdote that he was the, the like extra that shows up naked because apparently he had like a pretty good body and did a lot of working out and stuff and wanted to do that. Uh, she says how she mostly was just like the the caterer that was on set because the entire cast and crew kind of lived in this house as they were making the film. And so she just kind of spent most of the time like cooking food for everyone and running errands. And she would also like act opposite the actors during casting. Her stepdaughter actually plays the little girl in the film, the uh, daughter of the, of the protagonist, I guess. Um, she also talks about how there was like a ton of arguing on set between the two directors between like the amount of sex on screen. I think the guy Ellie wanted it to be like a more tame thing and then the other guy wanted like to up the sleeves to like sell the film and also like make it sexier and stuff. This next bit is a little bit upsetting. She recalls that like a lot of the actresses on set were crying a lot about their nude scenes and how they would like kind of make little makeshift pasties and covers for their breasts so that they wouldn't be fully nude on screen or whatever. She says that as she watches it today, she appreciates that there are feminist aspects of the story and that the, the lead has a lot of agency or the female lead has a lot of agency in how she conducts herself and behaves throughout the film. But she kind of wonders in a post Weinstein, post Me Too era, like how many of these actresses were kind of pressured or forced into doing these scenes because like they needed to sell the TNA and everything. And it was clear that they were at least to some extent uncomfortable with doing the scenes. Um, at the time she kind of figured that like, Hey, it's in the contract. You got to do it. Like, even if you're not super stoked about it, like, you know, it's your job and like you signed a contract with these scenes in it. So you got to do it. That was her feeling at the time. But in retrospect, she feels like there was probably more to it and that maybe they were push to go further than they had originally agreed to and things like this, right? She also says that there were a lot of parties on set to like boost morale, uh, where they would bring in a lot of drugs and a lot of sex workers for the cast and crew. And apparently like during the sex scenes, like all the men on set would kind of like gather around the camera, which is really weird and gross and like not, from what I understand, that's the opposite of professional practice when you're doing intimate scenes. Uh, you don't, you don't pack like all the jackals around the camera. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like typically you want that to be a, a bare bones set. It might have something to do with the reaction these women were having, right? So that's that interview. And then the last feature on it is an interview with uh, Stephen Thrower about The Black Room and the writer Norman Thaddeus Vane. It's an excellent interview as they always are. Stephen Thrower is the man. Like you know you're gonna be getting a good interview when he's on there. So the guy started as a playwright and changed his name from just Theodore Vane, V-E-I-N, to Vane, V-A-N-E. I guess he thought that sounded harder, which I think it kind of does. <laughs> Norman Thaddeus Vane is kind of a sick name, so good for him. He had a kind of mixed career of successes and flops as a writer and a director. Speaking of unsavory anecdotes, uh, he married a 16-year-old girl when he was over 20 years older than her after he had divorced two other women. Her parents were understandably less than enthused about this. Uh, he had to actually take her to Scotland to get married to get away with it because they allowed um, 16. 16 is like their their age of consent or age to get married or whatever without parents permission. Just really sleazy, gross shit. Um, he then proceeded to make a film starring Charles Bronson like about this very experience. Um, and then he says that the black room was based off of his real life experience renting a swingers pad in Hollywood. And he discovered that the owner was like peeping on him the whole time. Uh, the film also had significant early use of Steadicam and Thrower observes that <laughs> in talking with him uh, during the writing of his book, like he did a little profile on him. And so he had a lot of conversations with him. He says that like he noticed that there was a, 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 a consistent theme <laughs> whereby the other party in all his stories is always the bad guy and he's always getting screwed over and he never gets along with anyone. And he kind of implies like, I wonder what's going on there. You know, maybe the problem is you if uh, you can't seem to get along with anybody in your life, right? <laughs> so yeah, I really recommend this film. I really recommend this release. There's some really interesting anecdotes and interviews and all sorts of stuff. Uh, clearly the making of is not entirely savory. There's some 
unfortunate things that seem to have gone on behind the scenes, but the film itself is really quite interesting and entertaining. And yeah, I don't know. I do recommend this release. So there's the black room. And now we end the, uh, the Vinegar Syndrome 2023 reviews with this absolute behemoth. The just, I mean, I can't even imagine the amount of work and ambition that went into creating this set. But let me tell you, the amount of work that goes into reviewing it was quite a bit as well. I watched every film on this. I watched every supplement and every commentary, and I read both of the booklets cover to cover. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to attempt to review all 10 of these films, both concisely, but also intelligently. Like, I'm going to try to say something somewhat in-depth about each one of them without doing any spoilers. I'm going to make a case for why I think that this box set is worth having, even though it is like a huge blind buy. And then we're going to go through all the supplements and discuss those. And I'm going to attempt to rank these films at the end just for fun. So first, though, let's go ahead and unbox this really cool package here. Um, it has a magnet clasp here um, and it opens up and then it further opens here. Um, so you have all this artwork. Here's this. You got like original theatrical posters and some like writing and everything. Um, you get the two film canisters here. And then it houses uh, the slipcover and the the discs and everything and the booklets. Um, but it also, I like how you have this marquee here too. Um, it's difficult to do this without feeling like I'm going to break it. Um, this also folds out for the um, excellent artwork that was commissioned for this. Um, there's your full art. Um, and they are selling prints of this on their shop, and uh, I do think it's gorgeous and really cool. I think it's neat how they had to essentially, like, invent new packaging for this release, as they are wont to do. Um, I'm just unpacking everything right now. Uh, this does fit on a shelf, by the way. It's a little bit chunky for sure, right? But in terms of height and width, this actually does fit on your shelf as just like a chunky release or box set or what have you, right? So, okay, so we have our first disc thing, case, whatever, um, with the uh, more artwork on it. I like this a lot. Um, the images make more sense once you've seen it, but um, as I kind of said in my initial unboxing, there's nothing to, to differentiate this um, on the front and the back. There's no like print on the side that can tell me which is supposed to be the front or the back, so I kind of just have to guess. And there's your marquee with the uh, films that are included in this first case. Um, your titles and special features and such. And it's a three disc set. So there is that. There's also the booklet, with the exact same shot of this young woman's titties here. Um, I think I can get away with flipping through this, uh, but you have lots of writing and essays. And um, Haunt Love is the designer on these books as always, and he does an excellent job as always. Um, and you have the other one. Um, yeah, there's that one. There's this. Again, I'm just taking a guess as to what the front and the back is. There's your marquee again. There's your back and your features. And once again, three discs. Um, I did have a slight complaint in that it's not immediately clear on the disc art which film is on which disc. That's a very minor complaint because I could just not be a lazy piece of shit and <laughs> look at the back where it just tells me. Um, you know. And then we have the second booklet with more breasts. Actually, she technically has pasties on, so I don't know if I can get away with this, but, um, YouTube police. These are not female presenting nipples completely uncensored. She does indeed have pasties on. Yeah. It's unfortunate when you know what this is, but that design is fucking sick. And I would put this on a shirt, but... I'm hesitant to do it knowing what the character is. <laughs> and then let's see if I can get away with this again. Get your booklet. Lots of great juicy writing in here. Pause. 
person to me. All right, let's attempt to go through all these films. So if you're unaware of what this set actually is or what the conceit of it is or what it all entails, uh, essentially this is a box set comprised of 10 lost films. And if you're unfamiliar with what a lost film is, basically they are films that are no longer able to view because they didn't get either digital or physical home media distributions because not enough prints were made for theatrical distribution and the original film materials are either destroyed or lost. Um, there are different kinds of lost films, like there are some that presumably a negative or some kind of print exists, we just haven't found it yet, and then there are those that we have reasonable certainty that they are truly lost, but like the owner of the negative destroyed it himself or it was destroyed in like a fire on accident or something and the opportunity to make copies was not uh, was not there yet. So these are films that were previously lost in, you know, some cases since like the 60s and the 70s. So they've been lost for a long time. And because Vinegar Syndrome essentially purchases so many film elements and rescues so many film elements through their time doing that, they have found a considerable number of lost films. And this is their collection of 10 of those. Uh, it's kind of like the because vinegar syndrome, what it means is it is the actual chemical process of degradation for celluloid film. Uh, it begins to become vinegared, and the closer you get to that, the less usable it becomes. Uh, the image deteriorates, and the film stock itself deteriorates, and you're not able to get a good digital transfer or a good theatrical distribution um, or a good uh, theatrical screening out of it. Um, so this is kind of like the culmination of their mission statement of rescuing film elements and creating high quality presentations of previously lost or underappreciated films. And I think that this box set is truly like a success in every sense of the word. Uh, it is maybe my candidate or my pick for the best release of 2023 full stop period. Yeah, I think that's enough context to lay down the groundwork for it. Uh, and let's discuss the films themselves. So we start off with Barbara from 1970. Uh, this is maybe my favorite film off of the set, which is maybe unfortunate that we started off on such a high note, uh, but it is seriously just fucking insane. This is a, um, a softcore sexploitation film. Uh, basically what that means is that there's a lot of sex that happens in this film and it is borderline pornographic, but you're not going to actually see any like penetration or what are called hardcore scenes, which is generally just penetration, right? Oh. Oh. Essentially, I don't know. This is about a group of people, one of whom is named Barbara, presumably, right? Who sort of use their time on Fire Island to explore their sexuality. And they're kind of led by this almost like cult leader figure in seeing how far they can take their sexual liberation and freedom. Uh, it results in a lot of interesting things and a lot of things that I think we would consider to be cool and good and based like group sex and homosexuality and that sort of thing, but it also, there's also a lot of depictions of basically just like sexual assault that are, it kind of opens with like a very long extended sex sequence and a man kind of appears and while they're sleeping, he just like, he essentially rapes them, but they're into it. So I guess it's fine. It's questionable for sure, but it's all part of this like really kind of anarchic look at at sex and at, yeah, it kind of advocates for this sort of sexual anarchy that I think goes into territory that is problematic, but it makes for a really fascinating and transgressive and difficult film. And uh, it, it is really something to me that they decided to open with this one because it is maybe the hardest one to get through in terms of the content. Uh, so that feels like a bit of a tongue in cheek thing they did on purpose, like, oh, you, you, you spent $70 on films and nobody has seen? You really took that chance with us? Yeah, well, we start with this shit, you know? 
Uh, Heather Drain writes in her essay about the film that she hates the music, but I really don't agree. I think the music is so good, and I'm really kind of sad that this didn't come with a CD soundtrack. Uh, hopefully they can do a vinyl press of it at some point, because it's just this really weird kind of like... 60s Simon and garfunkel -y kind of weird freak folk stuff that like is very silly but is very catchy uh i especially the the ordinary woman song is really good and gets stuck in my head sometimes but i especially love the candy bar song it's really goofy and i just really like it i will say there is a scene of bestiality in this film so i'm i'm just kind of stacking trigger warnings here for you that um if you're sensitive to these kinds of things you might want to skip it now nobody actually sexually assaults an animal on screen but two men do have sex with a dog and the way that it is portrayed is a little too close to that actually happening for my comfort it is a lot yeah this <laughs> This film is pretty largely indefensible in a lot of places, but it just, I've never seen anything like it, and it takes it so far that I have to kind of admire parts of it, or admire the audacity of it. To be clear, I'm not advocating for most of what happens in this film, but I do think that it is purposefully pushing boundaries and making the viewer uncomfortable. Uh, I think that the first sequence in this film where you're just basically watching a couple have sex on the beach, which, by the way, for me personally, is maybe the single most uncomfortable place I can think of having sex with somebody is on the sand. Uh, you know, Anakin was right when he talked about how much he hates sand. I will never... People like to shit on that quote. I think it's the truest thing that's ever been said in a film. I don't like sand. But throughout the, the entire scene that we're watching, it's unclear to me if this is a real recording of an actual like congressional hearing or if this was just like staged but you basically hear people arguing about the necessity for free speech as it re relates to sexual content as it relates to pornographic content there's a very like purposeful intellectual debate happening uh while this is all playing out oh i guess i should be giving ratings as i go along here i gave barbara a 7 out of 10 and so i think that it is intelligent i think that it is making a statement even if i think that it takes some of these ideas too far. I'm looking at the runtime, I need to be quicker on this stuff. So let's move on to the Las Vegas Strangler from 1968. I don't think I'll be talking about these films as much as that one, uh, because that one I thought was the most interesting, or at least had the most to talk about. Um, Las Vegas Strangler is kind of a, it's a proto slasher, and it is kind of like we're talking about late 60s. So we're not talking about the slasher boom yet. But like Psycho and Peeping Tom are out. So you're seeing the seeds of this kind of thing starting to happen and it it definitely i think you could call this a slasher pretty comfortably and like the purists would get mad at you but i, I think it would fit in like a in like a film marathon of slashers or whatever like if you're gonna put psycho in there i think you could get away with putting this in there too uh but essentially this is a pretty low-key black and white uh film set in las vegas obviously about a guy who is just kind of killing women right it's not much more than that uh but it does have some interesting I swear, Psycho, like, really, for better or worse, has influenced the horror genre to such an extent that, I don't know, you can see, you can see it's, it's like, it's footprint all over so many different films. And this one is no exception in that, you know, it's not really the same way that they do it in Psycho, but the, the killer when they are revealed has some weird, like, psychological issues going on that are then haphazardly explained. I gave Las Vegas Las Vegas Strangler a 6 out of 10. Like, it's fine. It's perfectly serviceable for what it is while it's on, but it's it's nothing, like, incredible, right? Uh, next is the sex serum of Dr. Blake, uh, also known as Voodoo Heartbeat. Voodoo Heartbeat. Um, that first title is what it was called in its uncut version, and the more truncated, like, R-rated or even PG-rated, I think there was a PG cut out there. It's called Voodoo Heartbeat. Uh, this is, as you can probably tell, a sexploitation film about a scientist who creates a serum to increase sexual libido. From the forbidding darkness of man's forgotten past, it came. A creation of unbelievable power, an elixir of evil, brewed in the secret bloody rites of a voodoo altar to curse all those it touched with a lusting madness, an erotic nightmare of sinful vision and murderous craving. The print is a little bit rough, 
Oh, I will say the prints on the first two look great. Like they do look really good. They look really healthy. They have a they have a really beautiful image to them. You know, one last thing about Barbara, I do think that it just looks beautiful. Like I love the cinematography on it. I love the aesthetic of it. Um, okay, I'm gonna stop talking about Barbara, but like sex serum is a little bit rougher. This is clearly like a I mean, we're, we gotta take what we can get here for lost films, right? But like, we're talking about a uh, a release print that has burned in subtitle tracks, and there's actually two of them. I believe it's a Belgian print, so there's like Belgian and French language subtitles. I, I might be misremembering that. But you got two burned in subtitle tracks, and then if you're like me, you have the English subtitle track on top of that. And it's almost impossible to read. What I had to literally do was go to my actual like Blu-ray settings and move the subtitle track above. So it was covering a lot of the image, but like I could actually read it. It's not ideal, but it is what it is. You know, you take what you can get. This is another film that I kind of thought was just fine. Like for this kind of thing, it's decent. And there is a pretty interesting, um, another through line here. There's an interesting threesome on the beach sequence going on here. It, the sex looks a little bit more hardcore than I was expecting. Like, I think we're pushing it. And there's certainly a lot of uh, full frontal male nudity too, which is always appreciated. And, um, you know, with a film called Voodoo Heartbeat, you are going to have a little bit of questionable racial politics going on here or like making, <laughs> I don't know, kind of exoticizing. Is that a word? I don't know, there's some weird racial stuff in here for a little bit, but it's it's mainly just kind of like a silly sexploitation film. That one gets a six out of 10 from me as well. Next is a film called What's Love from 1987. This one I thought was pretty fascinating. Um, it's kind of, it's a, it's a film about the devil. I might look like this. And he is sort of, Okay, so I watched these all like back to back to back and it was a while ago at this point because this whole project has taken me so long, but like, and so specific plot details are perhaps a little bit hazy at this point, but um, I think essentially what is going on here is like the devil is, hold on, let me look it up real quick. Okay, I don't fucking remember what the plot of this movie is, and apparently the internet doesn't either, but essentially, like, the devil comes to Earth and sort of messes with various people, and there's, it's just kind of loosely connected vignettes of blasphemy and softcore and that sort of thing, right? I have any idea how well-trained and disciplined I am. Oh, I like that. The two halves of this film are, like, kind of directed by different people and, like, really far apart from each other so that kind of adds to the disjointedness of it but there are just sequences in here that really stayed with me and I like how abstract and like ridiculous and nonsensical and surreal the whole thing is um I don't know you have some really interesting sequences where the director is like being crucified like Jesus and there's priests that get really horny and there's like a motorcycle cop who gets seduced and it's just there's all sorts of wacky shit happening in this uh i gave it a six out of ten the first time i watched it but after watching it with the commentary and after it had stayed with me for a bit and i found myself thinking about it a lot i uh i bumped it up to a seven i don't know this is when you kind of have to see uh to to get a read on it's not one i can really describe to you super efficiently i think it's one that you just kind of have to see you know Okay, next is The Last of the American Hobos. Uh, this purports to be a documentary, but it very obviously isn't. <laughs> um, like, these are all clearly staged sequences of these quote-unquote hobos that are very obviously actors um, doing nothing, really? I don't know. There's not a lot that happens in this. It's just kind of like vaguely following around people more people should become hobos and learn to be nice and warm to each other doing stuff i don't know like it purports to be like a kind of sociological document or like a, an important treatise on like the value of these people's lives merry christmas bum and like giving you a peek behind the curtain to like lifestyles you're not accustomed to or something it, it fancies itself an anthropological sort of uh, project of sorts. 
but it's just it doesn't really work for me because it's so obviously staged and if you're gonna stage stuff you might as well stage stuff that's interesting you know um and i just don't really feel like that happens here so i don't know i gave this one a five out of ten it's fine uh the music is really obnoxious and it kind of plays a lot and it repeats a lot of the songs i don't know i just i didn't get a lot out of this one next is red midnight um, this one isn't necessarily as good as it is just batshit insane and fascinating. This is kind of a exploitation scare film directed by like an optometrist, I think. It was just like a guy that had a lot of concerns about various conspiracy theories and decided to make a film about it. It's not clear how much of this was intended to just be schlocky exploitation, how much of this is like an earnest attempt to make a real film that actually has important messaging. Um, there is like gratuitous nudity throughout that definitely doesn't feel like it's there for artistic purposes and feels like it's there to sell the film, you know? Um, it has maybe the most bizarre conspiracy theory I've heard in a while. It, it is, it's like a nuclear holocaust scare film. But the specific thing that the director is clearly afraid of is that too many of our structures and buildings are made out of wood. And if somebody wanted to, they could strategically set a few places on fire and then the whole country would go up in flames and just collapse. It's very strange. It's another one of these, like, you have to kind of see it to believe it type of things. There's like, there's like a scientist and his wife that get captured. And I'm trying to think how much I should say without spoiling, but like things happen to them and to her in particular that just boggle the mind and like the reactions that the characters give are not in line with what human beings would do and it's just really kind of fascinating. I gave this one a 6 out of 10 as well. I just, I enjoyed it. I don't, I don't know that I've seen anything like it and it is so specifically like <laughs> the wackadoodle fucking thoughts of one bizarre mind. Like, like crazy millionaire money to just kind of like put your strangest and most nonsensical thoughts onto film while also getting an excuse to like see some nudity and like film some gore and like it's just so bizarre so there's that next this is the one that was really being used to sell the package um that i think people were the most excited about when everything was announced and people were getting their packages in uh, this is the Rare Blue Apes of Cannibal Isle from 1974, and this is another kind of you have to see it to believe it sort of thing. It is so fucking wild and out there, like Clack Skull in the Muck is an eye. It's a musical. We will always see life through. It is a kids' film. <laughs> it reminded me a lot of. I'm going to throw out some points of reference that you may or may not know what the fuck I'm talking about. Um, it kind of reminded me of like the adventures of Milo and Otis complete with questionable animal treatment <laughs> mixed with We Sing in Sillyville. I don't, I, I'm sure I just awakened something for at least a few of you, some kind of locked repressed memory, but it feels like that kind of thing that you watch as a kid and looking back on, you're not sure if it was something that you dreamed or if it was something that really happened. Um, a lot of Teletubbies vibes going on in here too, I think. This is kind of a co-production between the United States and the Philippines. And it certainly looks like a Philippine film. Like it, it has that aesthetic and that look to it. I, should I even attempt a plot synopsis on this? Like it's about this kid who has a pet duck, I think, or is he a goose? I don't know, he's named Mr. Quack Quack. <laughs> He, uh, I'm pretty sure it's a duck. And, uh, his dad says he can't keep the duck. So he runs away and ends up on Cannibal Isle where these dudes in crocodile outfits <laughs> eat blue apes. And they're all, they're both just like big kind of almost like Chuck E. Cheese-esque like costumes or whatever. And, um, so the blue ape and the kid escape and are being chased and there's musical numbers some of which are real fucking bangers and the crocs have like cockney accents and i don't even know what to say um this is the kind of thing that has a lot of rewatch value but it also the charm of it does kind of wear off throughout the runtime 
I think I did land on a six out of 10 for this one as well, but it's certainly a fun one to throw on with friends and just kind of marvel and uh, watch mouth agape, I suppose. I will say the duck is treated not great. Like there's not any like overt, like horrible cruelty, which I was kind of led to believe going into it, but they clearly didn't have the duck's best interest in mind. And um, he, got, he gets put through the ringer for sure. The print on rare blue apes is fucking rough. Like it's clearly a few generations past the camera negative and it just, it looks rough. It looks pretty beat up. And um, there's a kind of pulsing effect to the colors that are pretty difficult to get through and pretty challenging on the eyes, I would say. Okay, next is Violated from 1973. This is another candidate for my favorite film in the set. And it's again, one that is not particularly difficult I have to be so honest. It's a pretty rough, well, roughy and rape and revenge type film. It's about a guy. I'm going to sound like a bad person saying I liked this, but it's about, it's about a guy who goes around breaking into women's houses or capturing them off of the street in various weird, freaky masks, rapes them, murders them, and then carves a swastika into their chest. It's just so extreme and so in bad taste and so like out there that I don't know it also just has like a really nasty seedy grimy aesthetic to it that I was into and you know with rape and revenge films there's always the revenge part and this is not necessarily like the I don't think any of his victims really make it but like there is a character that takes it upon herself with some friends to take matters into their own hands. And the stuff that they do is just as fucking insane and just as wild. And like, I don't know, it, this wasn't boring. I'll say that. And, uh, you know, this is not one that I would recommend without a lot of caveats. But uh, if you're a sick freak and you're into some of these more like sleazy films, I think you'll get something out of this. It was directed by one of the producers of Orson Welles' Touch of Evil and uh, Jack Arnold's The Incredible Shrinking Man. So it's really insane to me that a man of this prestige went on to just hop headfirst into the fucking gutter and make this shit. Oh, I'll say this. There is a ton of gratuitous nudity in this, and I think it is kind of funny, if not perhaps a little bit misguided, that the disc menu, like, clip sequence is just the woman getting undressed and getting into the shower. Um, which is fine, nothing wrong with that. But it shares a disc with the rare blue apes of Cannibal Isle. So the one film that you could ostensibly show to your kids or to kids in general, you have to kind of strategically quickly enough get past the disc menu so they don't see that part. Um, I don't know, that's kind of funny to me or that's kind of like, that felt like it was on purpose or something, but worth noting, I suppose. Next from 1968. Um... How do I say this? I'm not sure how to categorize this film. It's called Beware the Black Widow. It's kind of a slashery type of thing. Again, another kind of proto slasher where this person in like a black veil called the Black Widow is like killing people in a, in a sort of like brothel situation. They're kind of tied up with like the mob. More tricks a night, they make more dough. Point, baby, I got business to do. Then some like shady characters and they start dying. You know, it's another one of those that I don't have a ton to say about without spoiling anything. I will say it's pretty straightforward. It has like some beautiful like black and white cinematography. It is a time capsule of sorts. Who's a majigger? Don't call me no who's a majigger, you foreign string bean. And I do like the look of the killer quite a bit. I just generally think it's a, it's a pretty decent if not especially special film to watch, but it's, it's enjoyable enough and I do recommend it. Uh, I'd give that one a six out of 10 as well. And then the last film on here um, from director Joe Sarno is Deep Inside from 1968. As you can imagine, this is another sexploitation venture. Have you ever had an affair with a girl? No. But it's primarily like a melodrama. What an enthusiastic group. Like this girl gets a lot of her old friends and acquaintances together on this island, or on this uh, in this house on Fire Island yet again. I think it's interesting that we open and close with a film set on Fire Island. And she just kind of like is a little puppet master, like matching them up and this, that, and the other. And so people are just kind of having sex and or arguing. And the sex is not particularly like 
fun to watch. I don't know, it's kind of repetitive and there's some interesting sequences and some attractive people, but it just sort of meanders quite a bit. It's kind of long, like I think it's closer to like an hour 50 as opposed to like an hour 20, which is what something like this probably should be. Um, I don't know. I found it really, really hard to pay attention to this one and to like stick through it. But I will say the black and white cinematography is beautiful. Like I will give it that. And the poster for it is so great too. I don't know. It was like fine. It just wasn't really for me. I think I ended up giving this one a four out of 10, which is maybe a little bit harsh in retrospect. Maybe in retrospect, I would say that this is closer to a five and Hobos is closer to a four. So yeah, those are the films. If I'm going to rank them. Let's try to do that from worst to best. I think in retrospect, I was a little bit harsh on Deep Inside. Let's go last, last of the American Hobos, then Deep Inside, then Las Vegas Strangler, then Sex Serum of Dr. Blake, then Beware the Black Widow, then Red Midnight, then Cannibal Isle, then What's Love, mm, then Violated, then Barbara. I think I'm gonna go with that. I think I'm gonna go with that. That's my ranking. Definitive, set in stone, can't change the the official word on the subject, I think. Mm, no, um, that, that'll probably change if I end up rewatching any of these, but that's my sort of tentative ranking. Okay, let's try to go through these special features, shall we? I like that. So the first and primary and most important feature on here is the Against the Grain documentary uh, directed by Elijah Trenner from 2023, I think. Um, it's just so good. It is how, actually where I recommend you start with this set is you watch this first and you'll get a lot of context and a lot of appreciation for what you're about to see and why it's important. It's mostly about Vinegar Syndrome because they produced it and it's for their like flagship box set. But like it also includes a lot of input and a lot of um, time and attention paid to other labels like Severin and Distropix and Kino and Milestone. Um, there's a lot of love for just like boutique Blu-ray labels in general is kind of what it's about, but with a focus on Vinegar Syndrome. It honestly left me with a lot of questions about how this stuff works and like how film preservation and restoration and all these things work. I almost want to reach out to like Oscar over at Vinegar Syndrome or somebody to see if I can get an interview to like answer all the maybe dumb questions I have about this or uh, just talk about this stuff more, you know? I just think it's so fascinating and it's hard to get good information about it. And I just have, I just kept having to pause and rewind and being like, that was really interesting. Let me make sure I understood that. Or like, I have like another question about that. Let me make sure I didn't miss anything. You know, that kind of thing. I really believe that this is worth the price of admission for this box set on its own. Like, I hope that they do a standard release of just this documentary because I think it's worth getting out there and people seeing. I wish it was longer, honestly. I just think it's so good. Since this is its own film, I did rate it and I gave it an eight out of 10. Next is a little featurette called uh, Deep Inside Vinegar Syndrome, which is fun. Um, it's a fun look at like the offices at VS and you get to meet a lot of the staff and people that, um, I don't know, it's just kind of like a tour of their facilities and their offices. And it's a nice look at like the people who run all this stuff. Now for the rest of these features, I'm just gonna kind of go in order of like what you're gonna see as you pop the discs in or like to kind of pair them with the films as they show up in the set. So first you get a commentary on Barbara by Elizabeth Perchelt, who I'm a big fan of. She works at AGFA and does a lot of work in preserving and creating accessibility for like queer films and like uh, gay porn, that kind of thing. This one's really good. Uh, there is a lot of information and context, especially about the novel that the film is based on, which apparently is like way, way, way less defensible and more like controversial and more almost gross in how it like sexualizes a young girl and like goes harder on the bestiality and all that other stuff. Yeah, that, that's what we're working with in terms of what we're adapting into a film, right? There is some amount of like padding in the commentary. And this is something that you're going to see across a lot of these commentaries because kind of by design, I'm kind of surprised they went with commentaries instead of just video essays for all of this. Because, you know, as a rule, almost, there's not a lot of information on most of that, all of these films. And so filling a whole commentary with like, 
really interesting information or whatever is challenging for sure. Um, so she kind of goes into a lot of the history of the location of Fire Island and kind of the general state of sexploitation in the very late 60s and early 70s. Um, it's, it's a really good commentary that I recommend you watch. Next is a commentary on Las Vegas Strangler with Bill Ackerman and Amanda Reyes. They always fucking knock it out of the park and just pack their commentaries with wall-to-wall -wall information. I don't know how they do it, where they pull up some of this stuff or who they end up talking to to get some of this information, but they really do go deep on this one. And um, yeah, I really, I, uh, I recommend that one as well. Next is a commentary for Voodoo Heartbeat with historian Charles Devlin. He gives a ton of background information on the actors and the locations and stuff like that. Next is a commentary for What's Love by historian Sam Sweet, moderated by Joe Rubin from Vinegar Syndrome. There's a ton of information about the director and the history of pornographic censorship in Los Angeles. He makes a really interesting point about how the director grew up Catholic, and so he dealt with a ton of guilt for being a pornographer, but he also kind of identified with the persecution of Christ and how poorly people in his profession were treated and thought of. Like, especially at this time and in this city, like to be a purveyor of smut or director of pornography was considered to be like a very lowly profession. I don't know, people were really shunned for doing this work. And so he puts a lot of that kind of feeling of persecution and unfairness in this film. And I think that is really interesting. Last of the American Hobos actually had the most amount of like proper features attached to it. Um, first is a commentary with the historian Sean D. Langrick. It is uh, exceptionally well-researched and mainly serves as an autobiography of the director. So if you're interested in the director, that's certainly where you want to go. <laughs> There's what they call a deleted nude scene for hobos. Um, I'm not really sure why it was cut from the film. I guess deleted scenes get cut for various reasons, but it features some, let's say, conspicuously clean and attractive, fully nude women doing laundry uh, in the creek. And so... They're also like hanging out with the male hobos who are sufficiently like dirty and grimy and like regular looking and also wearing all of their clothes. Stuff like this where you watch and you're like, huh, that's just how hobos are, right? The, the women are all like perfectly hygienic and clean and pretty and have makeup and just don't wear any clothes. It's just how it is over there, I guess. Next is a short film directed by Titus Mode, um, the director of Hobos. Uh, it's called Outlaw Motorcycles. <laughs> I don't know, this one, you kind of have to see it just for a few choice scenes in here. There's a scene where like various women are getting tattooed. Oh, it's a, it's a film about biker gangs. I should have led with that. Um, and again, it purports to be a documentary, though I sort of doubt that. I will say at least the scenes that are staged here are far more interesting. <laughs> There's a scene where like this dude is just like tattooing various women with like branding for the uh, motorcycle gang in like a really crowded like seedy basement with like, I don't know, 50 dudes watching or something. And the women just like take off all their clothes to get tattooed and they're just like drinking the whole time and like it is perhaps the most unseemly and unclean environment to get a tattoo you can possibly think of. Um, it's fucking wild. And then there's also a scene where, like, the the bikers are, like, officiating a biker wedding in, like, a parking lot. And one of the dudes has, like, a swastika armband and is, like, all dressed up like a Nazi. And he just starts kissing all the dudes at the wedding, like, on the mouth. It's just... It's insane. Um... <laughs> I think I gave this one a six or a seven. I don't remember, but it was certainly interesting. Um, also, both of these films had like intros and outros by the director. I, I think you can skip them, but they are there. Next is a commentary for Violated with Chris Poggiali. He discusses how he had a list of like lost films in his Temple of Schlock zine in the 80s that he has been keeping up with for decades and is well into the hundreds. And uh, this one and Voodoo Heartbeat were two of the films on his list, so he was excited about that. <laughs> Beware of the Black Widow also has a commentary with historian Finley Freebert. Uh, this is just another one with a lot of like biographical information on the cast and the crew. And then finally, there was a commentary on Deep Inside with the historian Michael J. Bowden. Um, I thought that this was better than the film anyway, um, honestly. I just think it's really great. There's a lot of like good typical bi biographical information, but also like 
He spends a lot of time analyzing the film as it's happening, which I really appreciated. Kind of analyzes the themes going on and, as well as like the shot composition and the blocking throughout the film. So I really enjoyed that commentary and it, I think it did make me appreciate the film more on a second viewing. Okay, so that's all the on-disc features. And now before we take the Vinegar Syndrome 2023 reviews to a merciful close, let's go through the essays. We have another essay, or not another essay, but we have an essay from uh, Sean Langrick, the guy who did the commentary for Hobos. He does an essay on the director, and, you know, if you wanted even more information on him, like, this is a pretty good essay. Um, and then he actually goes into a few bios of a lot of the actors that are in the film, kind of. This definitely, like, like confirmed all my suspicions that these were just actors. <laughs> Next is an essay by Stephen Thrower, um, who I always love, uh, about Voodoo Heartbeat, uh, Sex Serum of Dr. Blake. It kind of goes through the history of the distribution of the film and the making of the film. This is where I got the information that there were like three cuts of the film, an X-rated cut, an R-rated cut, and a PG cut, which is insane to me. I don't know what is even left after you cut anything that wouldn't be PG. But yeah, he's just really stoked that this was found because this was like one of his grails, and he's just so happy to finally see it. Uh, next is an essay on What's Love by Charles Devlin. I like that the tagline on this film was very erotic, very artistic, but not a porno. I don't know, man. Especially in the last few scenes here, it's kind of just porn. Like, it it still straddles that line between being hardcore and softcore, and it's not quite hardcore, but, like, we're just watching a threesome for a while at a certain point, and, like, that rules, and I'm in favor of it, but, like, come on. There's artistic merit to it as well, but I think that there can be artistic merit to porn. So I don't know, that tagline is just funny to me. Oh, there's a really cool little like fun fact at the end of this where they point out that um, in the film Irreversible by Gaspar Noe, um, when you're actually in their apartment and there's like film posters everywhere, and one of them is 2001 A Space Odyssey, there is actually a full framed one sheet of this film in, in their room. And as soon as he said that, I was like, shit, you're right. I remember seeing that poster in there. So that's really cool. The next is an essay by, again, Stephen Thrower called A Remembrance of Films Lost. Uh, this was my favorite essay out of both of the books. It's just kind of generally explaining what lost films are, the different categories of lost films, and a few notable films that have been lost or notable directors who have a lot of lost films. It's just written really passionately and really makes the case for why even like quote unquote terrible films or bad films or films that seemingly have no reason to be there or um, don't have any like cultural or artistic merit should still be saved. Um, there's a really good quote in here. It's towards the beginning. I, I really like this quote here. Um, this is why it's so painful and tragic when a film is lost. It shouldn't happen, ever. No matter if they're silly or boring or inept or cliched, every film is a world and should therefore be protected from extinction. I recently watched Ray Dennis Steckler's Blood Shack, a film few people get excited about, and although I laughed at its meagerness, its slow poke repetition, its offhandedness, and its endless footage of the director's young daughters visiting a rodeo, I still came out the other end feeling like I had been somewhere. The Nevada desert, 1971, a tumble down hut beyond the, Las Ve beyond the Vegas city limits, a black clad loon named the chopper. I think that's a really beautiful sentiment and how like, even if there's not much to the films, right? If they're not that good, like you still feel like you've been somewhere. It's still like a time capsule and a like portal of sorts to another person's vision and to a time and a place that by definition no longer exists. So I really liked this essay. Next is an essay by Elizabeth Purchell uh, called Queer History Lost and Found. This is a really good essay about how she kind of purchased a collection of films and discovered that a lot of them were like really notable lost hardcore films from the gay scene and uh, kind of goes through the history of this one theater in New York City that kind of started to specialize in gay hardcore films. Uh, just another kind of manifesto for how important this stuff is, but generally also how film preservation is important, not because it just preserves cultural history in general, but because the voices and the output of marginalized people is more likely to be lost and more likely or less likely to be taken care of. And so this project that we're engaging with here is important in saving that particular cultural heritage. On to the next one. 
Uh, there's an essay from Nathaniel Thompson about Beware the Black Widow. It's a good essay about the history of the film and the people who made it. An essay by Tim Lucas on Deep Inside called The Beach House, Joe Sarno on the Threshold of Inga. This essay kind of just goes into the production history of Deep Inside and also places it in the context of Sarno's larger career and this period of his career in particular. Okay, this is an essay by Zach Carlson called Mr. Quack Quack and the Rare Butte and the Rare Blue Apes. This is probably my second favorite essay in here. Um, it is like simultaneously like celebratory of this film while also like constantly shitting on it and making fun of it. And there's some really great anecdotes and quotes in here. Hold on, I need to find some of these quotes because they're really funny. And... Yeah, it's this one. I fucking laughed out loud when I read this. So he's telling the story about how he was working on this essay and was watching the film again. And a friend of his or a roommate or somebody came in and was like, what are you watching? And he says like, I'm just gonna read it because it's so good. Anyway, as I was scanning through the film one final time to make sure I had everything needed for my essay, my good friend popped by for an unexpected visit. What are you watching? I told him it was a totally unknown, unseen movie about a mute kid who be befriends a blue chimp and a duck named Mr. Quack Quack. His eyes went huge and his mouth dropped open. Does, does it have an alligator who says blame it on the bobo? Reality kneed us in the face and jumped up the chimney. Uh, yes. Yes, it does. <laughs> it turns out that the film had somehow been sold in a syndicated in a syndication package to a local Texas TV station, and Mike and his roommates had caught it one afternoon in college, then let slivers of it fester in their psyches for the next 30 years. The this is the quote that I just will take with me to my grave. The sudden unveiling of Hachi, Mr. Quack Quack, and the Swampies was simultaneously a satisfying and horrifying revelation for him, just as it will be for you, proving once again that there is no God, but he still hates us all. Enjoy. Mm. Next is an essay from Sam Deegan about Red Midnight, from political propaganda to exploitation cinema. Uh, this is excellent. It really is where I got most of the information that I relayed to you in my little review. She did a great job researching this and kind of placing it in context of like the larger Cold War propaganda scare films and things of that nature. Next is an essay on Violated, again by Chris Poggioli. I think I... Uh, pronounce that differently than I did the first time. This is a really good essay about the history of this director and how he went from being like a fairly prestigious producer and filmmaker to just doing shit like this and was like boxed out of the industry and kind of was bitter about that, but also just went harder into making like ridiculous, like schlocky films like this, um, kind of cynically like provoking a lot of feminist movements and stuff like that to like make films as offensive and weird and out there as possible. The original name of this film was just The Rapist, um, and I think the distributor, uh, understandably, was not feeling that one. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's that. It's a good essay. And then uh, Heather Drain has a essay on Barbara called Multi-Partner Mazurka, or How the Counterculture Became the Counterproductive Culture. Walter Burns' Barbara. She kind of talks about how this is a film about a certain group of people for whom the 1960s meant sex and drugs, but it didn't actually mean radical politics and how those people kind of immediately sold out and became shitty Republicans. She also talks about how a lot of this stuff made her really uncomfortable, especially like the rape scenes and the and the dog scene, um, which is all understandable. I will just not take any slander against the incredible soundtrack. And then, is this the last one? Yes. Finally, we have Strangling and Loathing in Las Vegas, looking back on the Las Vegas Strangler's portrayal of Sin City by Amanda Reyes. This essay kind of mainly just talks about how she really appreciates this film because Las Vegas is a city in particular that is constantly changing. And so to get these sort of visual snapshots or these like celluloid records of the city at certain points in time in certain locations is kind of vital and unique um and especially how a lot of films set in las vegas show a very like flashy sort of touristy side of it and very few films actually show what it's like to live there and this is a film that she feels successfully does that uh and so just another kind of case for appreciating these films as they are even if they're not particularly great 
hopefully you got a good idea if this is the sort of thing that is going to be for you. Um, hopefully this convinces you to give this a shot because I really do think that it's important and I do think that it is worth your time and money. And it's a beautiful box set and a beautiful package and an excellent job from Vinegar Syndrome. Yeah, I hope I've made the case for why like films like this are important even if they're not particularly great, which to be clear, some of these films I did think were great. Um, some of them I just think were fine and some of them weren't for me, but like that's okay. Like a lot of films that I watch are not for me or not particularly great and like that doesn't mean that they shouldn't exist, right? Like I've seen plenty of other films from Vinegar Syndrome, from Shout Factory, from Kino, from Severin that I just thought were fine or didn't do it for me. But like they shouldn't not exist. They shouldn't not be accessible. And like I've seen stuff that's like a thousand times more popular than these films that I thought were was worse. And like I'm glad I had this experience going th well, going through all of this. Like it's now that I've seen it, it's kind of inconceivable to think of a world where they don't exist, you know? So I hope that this kind of promotes discovery, that this kind of helps jumpstart the discovery of other lost films and taking chances on lost films and uh, in a kind of sense of putting them out on Blu-ray and everything like that. Um, but yeah, that's the Lost Picture Show. Um, as a release, it gets a 10 out of 10 from me. Um, yeah, I hope that you got something out of this. And with that... That's the end of Vinegar Syndrome November. That's the end of Vinegar Syndrome 2023. Onward to 2024. Um, we fucking did it, you know? Uh, cool. <laughs> if you appreciated this, if you got something out of this, um, please hit the like button on this. I put so much fucking work into this and like, it would be really cool to see this video do well. Um, if you think that there anybody you know would find this valuable, please send it to them. Leave me comments to read. Tell me what you thought of these films. Not a lot of people have seen them, so I would love to start a conversation about them. Subscribe to the channel if you want more discussions on cults and art house films. Uh, and if you want to support me monetarily, there are links in the description for my Patreon channel membership and Amazon wish list. There's also the address for my PO box. <sighs> And you can follow my social media, um, Instagram, TikTok, Letterbox, that kind of thing. If you'd like to be a little bit more intimate. And with that, I think that's all. <laughs> Remember that Satan loves all of their children. Bye. I'd like to take a moment to thank our newest patron, Stephen Perkins. I'd also like to thank our accomplices, Anthony Listro, The Boogeyman's Closet, Carlin Cook, Deanna Vave, The Disconnected, Dustin Putman, George Strang, Julie Humphreys, Nosferatu 1334, Peppa Crab, and Sasha Bobashasaurus. If you'd like to be counted amongst their ranks, the link is in the description.